All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? All right, very good. My name is Sam Nasser, and this is the session on tools and procedures for securing .NET applications. A little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, restrooms, if needed, are uh, inside and uh, near the stairs across from the bar. Uh, please keep in mind that this is a forum for learning, so there is no such thing as a silly question. And uh, last but not least, if you would please put your cell phones on vibrate. For the agenda, as the title suggests, we're going to be doing tools and procedures. So we're going to discuss a few tools that are free from Microsoft that will help us encrypt our applications and secure them. And also we're going to look at non-coding approaches to securing our applications and, and procedures that we should implement in the organization. A little bit about me, I've been a software developer since 1995. I work for a company called NIS Technologies and I have some business cards available if needed, uh, where I also do uh, consulting as well as training. I've been certified from Microsoft in a variety of certifications and I head up the Cleveland c -sharp VB .NET user group. How many have heard of that user group, by the way? All right. Um, also, I've authored several articles for Visual Studio Magazine. Much of the content in this presentation can be found online as one of the articles on visualstudiomagazine.com. And last but not least, I've been Microsoft MVP since 2013, and uh, we'll find out effective July 1st if I continue that uh, tradition or not. So keep your fingers crossed. Uh, in regards to the Cleveland C-Sharp VB.NET user group, uh, we meet every month, uh, every fourth Thursday. Uh, the meetings are free of charge and open to the public, and we discuss anything and anything related to .NET. Uh, you can find the information on meetup.com, search for Cleveland C Sharp VB.net, and you'll find us on there. So I imagine you're all here because you're concerned about security, right? Why is there a concern about security? And this is a question to see that if everyone is still awake after lunch. So why are we concerned? Why are we here? Why are we spending a rainy Saturday learning about security? All right, so just to help jog your memories, I'm sure this is really what you wanted to say, uh, is that we have to be concerned with the data that we're protecting, uh, credit card numbers, uh, financial data, patient information. Uh, we also need to ensure application integrity, that the application that we publish is in fact the one that's going to be executed by the users. And we wanna ensure that if it's a web application, we wanna ensure uptime uh, that the application is constantly running. Also, uh, by protecting the data and protecting the, uh, the application, we're essentially protecting jobs, i.e. our own jobs. Many organizations, once they suffer a security breach, there's a lot of layoffs that have to take place in order to bounce back from that. And sadly, a lot of times, IT is the first to blame. What are the motives? Um, again, if I ask this question, I'm sure if it was before lunch, many of you would be answering some of these bullet points, right? So. There's financial gain, obviously, uh, to be attained from it. Uh, there's a sense of pride among hackers to be able to penetrate through a site or a system. Uh, there's also religious and political motivation, especially during election year. Uh, sites of the opposing party are always under attack uh, regularly. And last but not least, just the sake of vandalism. So if we look at the .NET framework, um, whenever we actually build an application in .NET, basically what we're doing is we're compiling down uh, not directly to native code, but rather there's this intermediate layer called uh, Microsoft Intermediate Language, or MSIL. And this essentially is human readable, we can modify it, and it's there for the purpose of tweaking an application and modifying its performance. And then uh, through the phases of running the application, basically the common language runtime then takes this MSIL converts it to native code, which can now run on the machine itself. So there's multiple layers that we're going through. We start with either VB.NET, C, C++, C Sharp, or a variety of other languages. They all basically compile down to this MSIL, and then they continue to compile down through the native code, all through the CLR, or the Common Language Runtime. So what's the worst thing that can happen? Any guesses? A little louder, please. Everything. Everything. Yeah, that's that sums it up. So let's take a closer look at it. How many of you are familiar with the ILASM or ILDASM utilities in the Microsoft framework? None? All right. Well, let's take a closer look at it. So 
what I have here is an application that I built in VB.net. And um, basically, it's a simplified application. I'll go ahead and run it and walk you through the uh, in-depth UI. It seems like everything is running slow after lunch. All right, so here's my application. And basically, it's uh, mimicking a text software. And what it's doing is it's accepting a total salary in this box. And then you press the calculate taxes, and then it will produce the total taxes due. This is obviously just a sample application. It's not really a, a real world app. And if I was to press calculate taxes without entering anything in, I see that I get a message saying, please contact customer support. Uh, it's a user friendly message, right? And if I enter in my total salary, let's say it's 100K, just for easy math, we have a rate of 37.65% uh, uh, that's being owed here. So what was to happen if I was to exit the application, and I'm going to close down Visual Studio altogether, and then I go into a Visual Studio command prompt, and what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to execute the ildasm utility. Now this, um, since it's small, I'm going to pull it up in the world's greatest editor, Notepad. And so what I have here is the, I'm calling the ildasm utility, and it's taking in uh, two additional parameters. I'm specifying the name and the path for my executable that I compiled. Now this is, again, not the native code that's going to be running on the machine, but rather that MSIL that's going to be executed. So I'm targeting that EXE or that assembly. And the second parameter that I'm passing in is I'm, I'm specifying that I needed to put out to the uh, myfile.il. So when I go ahead and execute the statement, it comes back, everything ran, and then I will open up in, again, the world's greatest editor. Because again, if a hacker was to hack in, he's not going to install Visual Studio on the server, right? But rather, going to use the utilities that are already there. So I'm going to call Notepad and pass in myfile.il, the file that I just created. And there I see what that missile language looks like, or the MSIL. Looking at it, just from the surface, it appears to be a combination of C Sharp as well as assembly language, where I see short clauses similar to assembly here. Now, for the sake of time and for the sake of the demo, what I'm going to do is, let's say that I know this file inside and out, and I'm going to search for, what was my tax rate again? 37, 37650, very good. So I'm going to search for that, and then, did I enter that correctly? There it is, 3765. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to modify that missile code. I'm going to make it 10%. I'm going to save the file. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to call its counterpart, which is ILASM, or Intermediate Language Assembly. The first one that I called was Intermediate Language Disassembly. So we're going from EXE to the IL. Now we're going from the IL to an EXE. And again, the parameters that I'm passing in are going to be the myfile.il. And now I'm pointing it to the output file, which is basically that EXE. So I'm going to replace that EXE. And if I go ahead and execute this command, And I see at the end it says operation completed successfully. If I look over in my folder under my bin debug, and I have it sorted by date modified, we see that I have tax calculator.exe at 1.10 p.m., which matches my current system time. Now, when I go ahead and run this, I enter in a total salary of 100000 calculate taxes, and now it shows that my total tax due is 10000 Can't hear you, sir. I like it. <laughs> Use it for the power of good. Use it for the power of good. <laughs> so what I did was, if you notice, Visual Studio was completely shut down. I opened it up in, uh, in Notepad and uh, the Visual Studio command prompt. I disassembled it, made the modifications, reassembled it, 
put it back out again as an exe and it went undetected. So what can I do to protect myself against this? Um, anyone want to take a stab at it? Yes, sir. I'm sorry? Checksums, okay. Sign your files, okay. What else? Crypto, can you elaborate on that? Right. So um, if I was to take a look at the file, now ilasm and ildasm, they can run command prompt and they can also be run through a GUI interface. So what I'm going to do is um, pull it up through the GUI interface and again I'm going to go through my command prompt CLS and I will say ildasm. And I'm going to look at it. I opened up the uh, the, um, the disassembled code, and so when I'm looking at it, um, I see. And I apologize, the screen size is relatively small, but uh, let me pull it up on the magnifier. I see uh, all the button names and the classes, and they have relatively meaningful names, um, which is one thing that we all <coughs> sorry, one thing that we always stress to junior developers, right? Have uh, variable names and function names that are meaningful so that way we can identify what's happening in the code. So I see things like button exit, button calc tax. And so I know, obviously, if I wanted the event handler for the, the button uh, for exiting, where do I go? The button exit function, right? Now, what happens if I was to jumble all this up? Now you notice my function names, they have been converted to some very generic names, A, B, C, D, and E. How can I figure out the function flow and what these functions do just by these generic names? It's going to be much harder, right? Significantly harder. This tool, DotFuseCater, uh, it's uh, produced by Preemptive Software, which is here in Cleveland, actually in Mayfield. And this tool has been part of Visual Studio since its inception of uh, Visual Studio.net 1.0. And the whole purpose of this is so that it basically, it obfuscates the source code. So when you ever have to disassemble it, it is not as easy to read and not as easy to dissect. Now this is the community edition that comes standard with Visual Studio. So it does not encrypt uh, hard-coded strings. However, the, if you upgrade to a licensed version, then those uh, encrypt hard-coded strings. And again, making it more difficult for someone to reverse engineer the code and find out what's going on. Any questions so far? Preemptive software. I'm sorry, preemptive solutions. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, one more time. From a hacker's point of view, you can use this tool. To do, well, yes, it's going to be harder to identify what's what. Yeah. Was there another question? I apologize for the, the background noise. Okay. How many have seen this utility before? How many have seen it for the first time tonight? All right, very good. Okay. So with regards to the DotFuseCater, it works with all .NET applications. So regardless whether you're building it in VB.NET or C Sharp or any of the languages that Visual Studio.NET works with, 
you can essentially use Dotfuscator to be able to uh, obfuscate your code. Uh, the Community Edition, like I said, is included with Visual Studio, uh, and it supports highly complex development and build environments, so uh, you can integrate it with TFS, so that way when code is checked in, it can then obfuscate it, uh, and then uh, publish it out to the servers. Uh, and it's very quick and easy to use. Uh, the utility is basically within Visual Studio, and you simply call it, create a project, actually. Let's step through a quick demo here. So there's this little useful utility in Visual Studio. If you forget where a command is, how do you find it? Other than tap your buddy next to you. In a Google browser, you mean? Mm -hmm. You could do that, but there's this quick launch utility up in the upper right-hand corner in Visual Studio and you type in the name of the utility that you're looking for, and there's Dotfuscator, and it's under Tools, Preemptive Protection, Dotfuscator. So if I go over into Tools, I see Preemptive Protection, Dotfuscator. Likewise, if I type it up here, it gives me all the different possibilities that match that, and so I can click it and just go straight to it. And so uh, here... <laughs> Okay, so this one requires a registration. Let's, let me circle back to this one again later. Oh, okay. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new project. And then I'm going to add a file. And I'm going to point it to my exe. And then I'm going to select Builds. And I see some text at the bottom as it's going through and providing the messages. And that's all there is to it. So basically, you run it through the utility, you open it up through Visual Studio, and you're able to um, obfuscate the code right on the spot. And now you have a new obfuscated EXE uh, that you can distribute to your users. So another useful way, someone had mentioned signing your, your executable. You can use the sign tool, uh, where essentially you're going to be utilizing a certificate to be able to sign your executable in the end. And again, this is a command line tool, and the command line tools, they're all executed through a Visual Studio command prompt. And in some cases, you have to run it as administrator, uh, but essentially through the command line tool, you're able to execute all the tools that came with the .NET framework. And it digitally signs the files, and what it allows you to do is to verify the signature in the file when you go to execute it. So if someone essentially intercepts that, ex that signed executable and tries to run it, because it's been altered, they're going to see a message like this where, they cannot, where the signature cannot be verified. And so again, we're ensuring application integrity to ensure that the user runs the application that we intend them to run. A third uh, tool that comes with a framework is ASP.NET RegIIS.exe. Rolls off the tongue very quickly, doesn't it? Uh, how many of you are familiar with this tool? So the primary purpose of this tool is what, sir? <laughs> All right, fair enough. So this is basically a registration tool for IIS, or uh, Internet Information Server, and or services. And what this allows you to do is to be able to identify 
what version of ASP.NET you have, uh, deploying different versions and upgrades. But then it also comes with a, another feature where it allows you to actually encrypt and decrypt. So again, this is part of the .NET framework, free of charge. Um, and uh, essentially, you can use it for encrypting and decrypting just by specifying the command line flags. So here, I'm going to specify dash PEF, where I want to encrypt the connection string. And I'm going to specify section connection strings in my web config file, and then specify the path that it's going to be pointing to. And so with the PEF option, basically, it encrypts. And then to counteract that, or to unencrypt it, basically, I would use the dash PDF, or decrypt. So in order to be able to encrypt and decrypt, I need to have uh, the, the user account must have read access to the encryption key. Uh, and then the default uh, provider is the RSA protected configuration provider, and that's in the machine config file. But you can also select a different uh, configuration provider or a different um, uh, encryption provider. And so let's take a look at how that executes. Let me close a few things down here. All right, so I have a little cheat sheet here um, where I have all the commands typed in. And so what I'm going to be doing is I need to execute ASP.NET Reg IIS, and let me clear the screen for clarity, and we'll enter in, we'll paste our command in. And so, again, there's, I'm passing in multiple command line parameters, dash PEF, the switch, specifying the connection string section, and then I'm pointing it to the web config file and the path where that's located. And let's take a look at that web config file. There's my web config, and there is my connection string section. Let me amplify that a little bit. And so as you can see, my connection string is completely open, human readable, and anyone can figure out what my user ID is, what my password is, and where the server is at. Okay. So if I was to execute this command, I got the message that it succeeded. I go back to my Visual Studio, and it tells me the file has changed. Do I want to reload it? And I say yes. Now, looking at my connection string, completely encrypted, not very easy to read. I can't decipher what server is being used. I certainly don't see a user ID and a password in there, so it helps to keep my web application secure. I'm sorry? It, there's a provider that is pointed, that is specified in the machine config file, uh, and then the certificate would have to be installed on that machine. In addition, the user that is uh, doing the encryption must be the same user that's going to be, that the application is going to be running under, because it's going to use that, those credentials for decrypting it. Okay? It's part of the .NET framework, so you would execute it on the server side, and because we're protecting the web config, right. So essentially, you're encrypting the web config, and what happens is, let's say you're using Entity Framework uh, as your ORM. Then what it's going to do, it's going to read that connection string. Because it's logged in as the user that has access to that encryption key, then it can decrypt it in memory without exposing the user ID and the password on the server, right. How many of you are seeing this for the first time again? All right, very good. A productive Saturday afternoon, huh? Excellent. Any questions? Okay. And so to decrypt it, it's the opposite where, again, we're now going to be specifying the PDF for decrypting, but it's the same thing. So I'll copy the command. And then I'll paste it in my command prompt. So I'm specifying the name of the executable, dash PDF for the flag. 
and then connection strings uh, as the section that I wanted to unencrypt in my web config file, and then the path to the web config file. And once that's executed, I'll go back to my Visual Studio. Wrong one, there we go. And once I reload it, now I see the unencrypted connection string available to me again. And the fourth tool that I'm really fond of, this is one that doesn't get much uh, advertisement, not even from Microsoft, but it's uh, BSA, or the Baseline Security Analyzer. Uh, this is a software, or a piece of software that can be downloaded free of charge uh, from Microsoft's site, and it determines the security state by assessing a variety of different things, and it scans your PC as well as all the machines on your network. Um, so it looks for things like OS security settings, Windows components, if you have any loopholes, for example, you have, uh, you don't prompt for a password, or you don't ha you have a guest account set up, or you have a, um, uh, for example, you have a SQL Server installed, but you're using the standard SA uh, password. Uh, anything like that will get flagged, and basically what it looks like is, let's go ahead and call it, So it comes up, and then there's a variety of different things. I can scan multiple computers on a network. Uh, since I'm not connected to anything here, I'm just going to scan my own computer. We'll go ahead and hit Run. It's going to prompt you for several things that uh, it can look for. So it can check for, and let me magnify this again. So it can check for Windows uh, administrative vulnerabilities. It can check for weak passwords. Uh, IIS or SQL uh, vulnerabilities, security updates, and it gives you a state of the machine and what needs to be addressed. So I'm going to go ahead and start the scan. And just to fast forward a little bit, I'm going to show you what the results look like in the end. So it produces a very user-friendly format. Uh, and I, again, I could use, basically cut and paste this and put it into a report for a client but basically it gives you the name of the machine when the, uh, the scan was run, and then it flags things with color-coded flags. So here are my security updates for ASP.NET is getting a green check mark. So everything is kosher there. It gives me a history of all the different uh, packages that were installed, and now some things that are getting flagged with the yellow exclamation point. I have local account password tests, uh, obviously, that's something that can be easily hacked into. My password expiration is not set. Uh, there are some issues with my Windows firewall. So on and so forth. Here it's showing me some issues regarding SQL Server. And it produces a pretty detailed report, about nine pages worth, just for a single machine. So takes a little bit to run, but again, I just did a, a shortcut to show you what the results will look like. But again, it's a free tool from Microsoft, and it can scan either your own computer or computers on your, on your entire network as well. Any questions about that? Okay. Uh, as far as I know, it's just defined in, in the, uh, the application itself. I don't think there's a config or uh, anything that you can specify. Okay. So basically, we covered four different tools uh, that are included or free of charge from Microsoft. <clears throat> and as the presentation title suggested, we're going to talk about tools and procedures. So the following portion is going to discuss procedures that we can implement uh, within our organization for uh, making it more secure. How many recognize this picture? Fort Knox. What's hidden in Fort Knox? 
well, not hidden, but other than the conspiracy theory, what's stored in Fort Knox? Gold, and lots of it, right? So uh, let's say, obviously, they're housing something very valuable here. In order for me to get through there, what are the different avenues that I can pursue in order to penetrate these walls? Through the front door, right? What else? Let's get creative. Tunnel in, Shawshank Redemption style, right? What else? Yes, sir. <laughs> right. How else? Drive a car? Well, it could be risky, but yes, you certainly could, right? Uh, one of my favorite answers that I got previously was get a job there. I'm like, perfect, <laughs> right? Very true. So the reason we need to think of the different points of entry is because there was a, a hack that uh, Target encountered a while back. Um, how many have heard of this story? Right, what happened there? They came in disguised as HVAC and they were cleaning the vents and they came in after hours and of course, since it was after hours, they just had a... Uh, free reign of the place. Um, and so we always think of security. Uh, we're always worried about security updates and encryption and more thinking more of high-tech approaches, but really it's the low-tech approaches that sometimes we overlook. Uh, and so something as simple as this where you have people coming in to clean the, uh, the HVAC system, they're the ones that penetrate your servers. Uh, so with that in mind, Security is a holistic solution. It cannot be solved by just one thing alone. It is not by encryption. It is not just by securing the location of the servers. Oh, by the way, my baseline security analyzer is done now. And so here's a full report on, on my machine. In any case, not to digress. So the point that I'm trying to make is security is a holistic solution. You have to look at everything from A to Z. I had a client one time, I went there, they were in healthcare. And I saw their server room was propped open with a fan running. And I said, is this, is this legitimate? Is this, is, did you intend on doing this? It's like, well, the AC broke down and we really don't have a choice. And they were in an office building that wasn't entirely theirs. They were sharing it. And they had other people on the floor. So anyone could have easily waltz in, pull out a hard drive out of the server, and walk out with it. All right. So first and foremost, the location of the servers, you need to house that and make sure that only limited people have access to it. Uh, you need to look at the server configuration, make sure that my updates, uh, I have all the patches installed, that I have only the software that I need to, to run only installed on there and nothing more. Um, we're also going to talk about user training, having your users involved to participate in helping to eliminate uh, hacks. Um, now, we always do uh, code reviews whenever we do um, you know, updates to our system. How many of you actually implement a security code review? Two people, three, four, five, do I hear six? Okay, so when we build an application, we wanna make sure that it'll prompt the user for a user ID and a password, and then it will let them in. But do we ever check to see that our application is not susceptible to SQL injection? Hardly any anyone that I know of, except for these five folks, do them, right? It's always get it working, okay, slam it into production and let's move on to the next task. So security code review needs to be a follow-up task um, as well as security testing. We constantly need to test our applications only from a security perspective. Just because the application works doesn't mean that it is not easily hackable. So again, we need to ensure that. And then we're gonna talk about active defense, which is one of my favorite things. It's very low-hanging fruit, things that we can implement to actually find out if our system is being hacked or not. And last but not least, regardless if you implement all these things and more, there will come a time when your organization will be hacked. So the question is, what do we do at that point? What kind of data am I housing? What kind of data is at risk? What do I have to do to protect it once it gets out into the wild? It will happen. So first of all, engaging the user. Um, since uh, IE8, they have always been utilizing the domain and the URL where they're highlighting it for the user. Uh, so here, for example, with example for dollarbank.com, you see that the domain name is highlighted. So if the page ever got hijacked or someone hijacked the site, 
obviously the URL would be different. So here they're always pointing out, take a look at the, the domain name. Also, there's a message here for our user. If something doesn't seem right, contact, oh sorry, it's down here. If something doesn't seem right on this page, contact this 1-800 number. So here I enter in my user ID and my password, and then it takes me to a uh, second uh, form of authentication where I'm entering in another phrase, but then there's also a symbol here that's used to um, authenticate or make sure that, I, in fact, I am hitting the, the dollar bank site. Why is this important? So this is a symbol that I selected for my account. That's the challenge. Okay. It's part of my authentication, right. So, and again, it's telling you here, if you don't see your security image, call this 1-800 number. So here, we're engaging the user to let them know, if you see something suspicious, call us and let us know. Another feature that I'm very fond of on my credit cards, I always have email alerts whenever I have anything more than a dollar being uh, placed on my credit card. So have your users enroll in something like this where they're getting notified password changes, any uh, account withdrawals or deposits, um, anything that certainly seems out of the ordinary, notify them. You also want to implement active defense monitoring. So you want to look for things like out-of-bounds costs, meaning that it is a cost that is out of range. When you buy an airline ticket within the continental U.S., typically, what's the, the typical price? A couple hundred dollars, right? Um, what if I told you that, what if you looked in your database and let's say you were in charge of an airline and you saw ticket prices that were being sold for $50? What would you say then? Something's up, right? Or even worse, I'm sorry? Unless you had a special, right. Now, it would, be, it would be real special if you saw a lot of $1 tickets being sold. That would raise suspicion. And that actually happened with, I won't mention any names, but it was an airline that flies to Alaska quite often and there was a hack in their uh, config file, and someone exposed it, and they essentially let all their friends know, and they were buying airline tickets for a dollar. And it went unseen and undetected, and of course the airline had to abide by it afterwards. So you wanna look for things that are out of bounds, out of your norm, right? Um, excessive number of transactions, uh, where we have after hours access. Now this is gonna be a little touchy because many organizations, they operate after hours, but for those that their main hours of operation are between nine and five, i.e. the banking industry, i.e. the school systems. Um, so someone logs in at you know two in the morning, something is wrong, especially if they do it regularly or for extended login periods then something is up. So how do you guard against active defense monitoring? Looking at this, can anyone tell me what this is? Store procedure to do what? So it's a trigger. I'm sorry? A trigger to send email alerts when? Costs are out of range. So here I'm checking to see if a cost is less than $50 or greater than 1000 Then I know something is up. Send an email alert to a group. Now obviously here I just have it to security team at acme.com. And so you notify the group and this way you're raising a flag. Something is up, something happened, let's take a closer look at this. Had this certain airline implemented something like this, they would have prevented that attack. How long do you think it would take to implement something like this? Other than cutting and pasting it from my slide. Not very, not very long, right? There's some things you gotta do to configure a SQL Server, but you can essentially send emails directly out of the server uh, based on this uh, trigger situation. We also talked about a security breach strategy. If you had patient information or you had um, financial data just the fact that foreign eyes might have fallen upon it, you are by law required to report it to the users. When you report it to the users, what is that doing to your organization? Creating bad PR, right? I got a call one time from my former boss where I had a uh, contract with the federal government and he said, your forms that contained your social security number were in a, in a box that was left unattended 
uh, and may or may not have been seen. I'm like, may or may not? <laughs> what do I do now? All right. And so obviously it gives a bad rap for, the, uh, for that organization. But you need to define a security breach strategy. Once my uh, account gets hacked or once my data gets penetrated, who do I need to notify and how? Um, also, take into consideration, for example, FTD Floral or FTD.com. Now, what are some of their busiest days of the year? Mother's Day and Valentine's Day, right? So let's say that we find out that we have a security breach that happened and I'm in charge of the data center. Do I yank the plug out of the wall on Valentine's Day and risk millions of dollars being lost? Or do I just take it on the chin and know that I'm gonna make more millions than what is being lost? So that's something that has to be defined ahead of time, certainly not the day of or the moment of. Um, you also need to define an escalation procedure. Who do I call, when, and have these numbers available uh, and discuss it with the team as well. And like we talked about, you need to define allowed or disallowed actions. Do, again, do I yank the servers and disconnect them from the network or do I just let it go and, and um, we as an organization will take it on the chin. So these are things that need to be defined by the higher ups and again, a strategy plan needs to be put in place. Similarly with the notifications, uh, so if I have, uh, let's say social, excuse me, social security numbers that have been compromised, what is my, um, what is my strategy at this point? Do I notify internal management? Do I go to local or federal authorities or the news authorities, uh, the media? Uh, do I put an online warning on my website for users? Um, or do I just discontinue the application availability and like I said, just yank it out of the wall altogether? Again, this is all things that need to be discussed ahead of time. So with that, uh, basically taking all things into consideration, this is what I consider your nine item laundry list. So first of all, take a look at the location of the servers, see where things are stored, where servers are stored, how the servers are configured. Do they have the latest updates? Do they have only the software needed to run them? Um, my network configuration, I am not a network guy by any means, but I certainly wanna make sure that <clears throat> all the ports that are not needed are closed. Um, also, I want to be able to train my users and, and let them know to engage and to let me know if they see something that is fishy or uh, subject to uh, a hack. Once I write my code and I have my application developed, uh, before deploying it out into production, obviously we go through a code review, but we talked about doing a security code review, right? And then just like I test my application to see that if I add A and B and I get C, likewise I want to make sure that I don't uh, add in something that is unexpected and get exposed something uh, in, um, in my code. For example, uh, if I do a divide by zero error, is it gonna throw an error and show me a, the portions of the code where that error had occurred? I want to be able to turn uh, custom notifications or custom errors on. Active defense like we talked about. How do we implement the active defense? Anyone remember that slide? What was it? I'm sorry? A SQL trigger, right? I just place a trigger on my table where I'm seeing the, the cost coming in or the price of an item. And if the price is out of bounds, then I know something is wrong and I need to raise that to the next level. Uh, recovery plan. Basically identify when and, and uh, who to escalate things to, uh, who to notify and uh, after I have all these things in place, I need to test my implementation, have some trial runs to make sure that people do, that phone numbers are up to date uh, and that people can be reached when they say they can be. And basically just do a mock test, similar to the same way we do stress testing and, and, uh, and QA testing on our applications, we need to do a similar testing approach but from a security perspective. Okay, any questions? None at all? All right. So if no questions for me, I have a few questions for you. What are some of the things that we talked about today? And more importantly, what are some of the takeaways that you can walk away with today? A little louder, please. Sign your data on your executables. Okay. 
So sign your executables. What else? <laughs> Don't leave the server room unattended or opened. Correct. What else? I'm sorry? A little louder, please. Encrypt things, okay? But more importantly, what did we talk about today? What are the four tools we talked about today? Ildasm and Ildasm, so Intermediate Language Disassembler and Intermediate Language Assembler. What do they do? Right, so I can disassemble that code and I can see it. I can open it up in the world's greatest editor, which is what? Notepad, right? And so uh, the reason I opened it up in Notepad was to show minimal tools. Notepad is installed on every operating system, right? So if I hack in and I am disassembling that code, I can pop it open in Notepad, go through, search for certain things, and make my changes. <clears throat> um, how do I prevent against uh, disassembling the code other than signing and, and strong names? What's the tool that I mentioned? Dotfuscator. And who makes Dotfuscator? Preemptive Solutions out of Cleveland. And then the Community Edition is free of charge with Visual Studio. Um, how do I encrypt my connection strings? Should I encrypt my connection strings, first of all? Right? Yes, I absolutely should. And how do I do that? <laughs> the one that rolls off the tongue, ASP.NET reg IIS.exe. How could you forget that? Um, and uh, what is the free tool that helps to scan my computer as, other, as well as other computers on the network? I'm sorry? Very close. Baseline Analyzer, right, BSA. Uh, so that is a free download, uh, ASP.NET, Reg IIS, Dotfuscator, Ildasm, and Ilasm. Those three tools come standard with the .NET framework. Uh, you download BSA, which is free of charge, and a great tool in my opinion. Um, what are some of the procedures that we should implement in our organization? Security review. He stole yours. Okay. What else? Testing. So we have a security testing phase just for to ensure that our app is uh, ensures integrity, right? Um, what should I do to uh, my server room? Lock it. Make sure there's limited access to it, right? Um, okay. Here are some references uh, regarding uh, configuring a secure application. This was uh, the majority of the content that we discussed today. Uh, and again, again, you can find it on visualstudiomagazine.com. The uh, Microsoft Assessment Tool and Baseline Analyzer, there are the links for downloading these tools. And then securing the connection strings via ASP.NET Reg IIS. Uh, that's available also through uh, msdn.microsoft.com. Lastly, my contact information. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter. I also have some business cards up here. If any questions were to come up later, or if you're interested in additional training, I'd be happy to help with that. Any questions before uh, I let you have 10 minutes back? All right. Thank you all for your time, and thank you for coming.